Listen, Nietzsche, you little German incel who runs around your little mountain writing all your little dweeby books about Zarathustra and the Ubermensch and the Willst du Magst. I bet if you met the Ubermensch, you would ask him to oil himself up in coconut oil and take you by force, because that's the only thing you seem to understand. With your little chicken body. With your little profound thoughts. If I was back there in the 19th century, knocking about the forests, knocking about Bavaria, knocking about the Alps, I'd find you as you're limping across your mountain, trying to think, trying to think your way out of loneliness. And I'd find you and I'd grab you and I'd bend you over my knee. And I'd show you the difference between right and wrong. <laughs> so I was chatting with some boyos about free will. The tragic, difficult, scary question of do we have the ability to choose what we do in life? Or is it just an illusion that our mind presents to us so we don't go crazy and realize that we're stuck inside some type of machine where everything just happens and we are merely almost watching like it's a film of some sort and all our pain is already predetermined and whatnot. Scary thought to say the least. And look, I'm not going to talk about that necessarily. I don't necessarily have a philosophy on it. I am not a advanced philosopher. I don't really understand the physics of the universe in order to make good arguments in this sense. So yes, you can leave now if you wish. But I am going to talk about the evolution of the idea of will to power and how it relates to the idea of our conscience. Because something that really blew up in this channel was that conception of Christianity, that young enforced, where you can imagine that you have this inner voice, which is your conscience. We know this experience. It's like, what the hell? There's something inside of me that's sort of commentating on what I do or, or giving me this sort of feeling of advice of some sort. And it seems to be guiding my decisions. And when I ignore it, bad shit happens. And when I do, when I go with it, when I go with my gut or go with my conscience or go with my intuition, it tends to be right. It tends to be useful for making decisions. And then Jung, of course, says, Jesus Christ is the one who sits there on that self, on that throne. And that is the leader of that conscience. He is the model for the perfect way to act. And so what we are sort of doing inside our heads is, is we are thinking, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And unconsciously, we know that the best thing for you to do is to act more like Jesus. What would Jesus do? Oh, shit, we should be like Jesus. But of course, you, like, you can't bring that up all the time, but it's unconsciously getting processed. And so your conscience compares, all right, how am I behaving to how does big old J behave? And then your unconscious says, oh, and it sends like forward feelings or maybe a little voice that tells you what to do in that moment. You, you're like, oh, should I, should I eat the sandwich? Should I, uh, should I open a porn hub? Should I, uh, should I be weak? Should I, should I not say the truth and lie? Should I do that? And then something deep in your mind knows that Jesus would say the truth. Jesus would stand for it. Jesus wouldn't open up a porn hub. <laughs> and so you get that feeling. You're like, mm, it's wrong. But then you have this weird other part of you that's like rationalizing, saying, no, it's so right. You know, you can just do it and nothing bad is going to happen. You know, you can just watch that bit of porn hub and it's going to be fine. You're going to enjoy it. You might, um, might dirty your curtains a bit, but then it'll be grand. It'll be over and you can just get back on track again. You know, it's, it doesn't matter. Like, go for it. You know, live a little. <laughs> and this, I guess you could say, is the counterforce, the other side of your rationalizations. Perhaps it's the rationalizations of uh, lower forms of you, perhaps Satan's forms of you. And these are, of course, connected to God's plan. If everybody acted more like Jesus, things would work better. And if everybody acted more like Satan, things will start falling apart. We'll fall into the kingdom of hell versus rise up into the kingdom of heaven, God's kingdom that he promises that we can have if we act like his boyo, his main boyo number one. So that, that was a meme that popped very well, and I find it a fascinating meme, a very practical meme. It's a, a meme that brings quite a lot of philosophy 
and grounds it in a very useful way. The discussion about free will is a difficult one because it involves, I guess, remodeling the universe to, to try to figure that stuff out. But I am an existentialist philosophically. I focus more on our existence and how that affects us. And one aspect of that is, of course, decision making and how these things appear to us. And Jung gives us this model. Now, Jung got this model or shall we say Jung evolved, transformed this model from his predecessor, Sigmund Freud, who I, I actually really, I think is really funny. I got to give it to Sigmund Freud. He's, he, he's very funny the way he, he, he frames everything. I like that. So he, <laughs> so Freud had his model. But of course, Freud said once in his life, I, I've got to stop reading Nietzsche because if I keep reading Nietzsche, there'll be nothing left to discover. Freud almost felt like he was plagiarizing Nietzsche in a sense, because Nietzsche just nailed everything. And all Freud could really do was take Nietzsche's frame and test it a bit and then reconceptualize it based on his observations. And so that's a lot of what Freud was trying to do. And so Freud got this model for how the mind works, this existential model for how these decisions get made. And I will talk about what that is in a second. Maybe I'll say it now. I'll work backwards. So Jung was talking about, you know, God's plan, Jesus Christ, the self and all this. And then you're fighting against Satan and all that. Freud is coming more at the idea of, you know, you have a super ego and then you have this little ego in between. And then you have the id, the desires. And the superego has been programmed into you by society. That's your conscience has been programmed by society. So what is right or wrong depends on what your society is. Brain has socially conditioned you to think. Your parents, your church, all of that stuff. It goes, it brainwashes it and it says, these are the rules. And then when you want to make a decision, this, this unconscious superego says, don't do that or do do this. And it, it kind of tortures you a bit because you're like, oh, what do I do? And then you have the, these, these desires coming from the id trying to say to you, do this, do that, um, eat the sandwich, eat the sandwich. And then you have the, the laws saying, don't eat the sandwich. Or you watch the porn and the law the law saying that's the, the Catholic laws, you know, or the Christian laws saying that's wrong, that's bad, that's evil, that's Satan speaking, you know. And so that was Freud's model. It was more, shall we say, um, more separate, less connection to the more metaphysical stuff. Freud would, in some sense, suggest that that superego is a little bit tyrannical and not necessarily connected to any higher good. And Jung advanced that idea in a very interesting way. But then, of course, you take it back. All of this stems from Nietzsche. And Freud based the id, the, the drives on this idea of the libido, the desire for life. And then you have this controlling aspect up here, whatever that might be. But that fundamental drive for life is very, very, very similar. I, I would even say derivative of Nietzsche's conception of the idea of the will to power, the willst to Marx, as he said. So this is an important thing because most people hear the will to power and they're like, oh, what an evil. He's like Sauron. He's like Sauron had it right. Sauron got it all right. What you, what you need to do is you need to like maximize your power and get everybody and make everybody a slave. That's what, that's what Nietzsche is saying. Make everyone a slave and oppress everybody. That's the correct way to do things. Yes, I've, I've understood Nietzsche now. So Nietzsche is a bad dude. Because he, he wants to be Sauron. He sees Sauron as the ultimate good. And then when you translate it into the German, willst du machst? Now, this is interesting because machst is, like, it does represent the word power. And there is an aspect of the oppression not being as negative as we see it in Nietzsche's frame. But it's closer to the idea of make. Now, our conception of power is very, very blunt, industrial in some sense, horsepower or something like that. But might makes right in some sense. But Nietzsche's got that little taste of make in it. And if you look through the, the, the understanding of the word, it does, does tend to have these resonant connections to it. So Nietzsche was saying the will to create in some sense, which is a slightly more noble framing of it. And Nietzsche would, of course, be all about nobility. Like when he asserts his dangerous idea, he's not necessarily saying, all right, we should oppress people. That's the end goal. We should be Sauron. He's saying we shouldn't necessarily be 
sacrificing sacrificing a great vision, a great kingdom, a great empire, any envy of that stuff for the sake of making people feel good. And of course, that can go to crazy positions. That's sort of like the the means just the the end justifies the means. But at the same time, it means that um, there's no need to make people suffer for no reason as well. That's actually implicit in it. It's just it, the indifference to suffering means that you don't actually have to cruelly torture people, nor do you have to necessarily like d- like allow your kingdom to collapse just to serve their their feelings and all that. It's it's a, it's the sort of indifference, the tough love, if you will. And the wills to do Max would have that idea in it is that the the goal, the desire to create something is more important. That's the prime thing. And where our emotions come from is that they have this desire built into them. Like what we are in some sense is the manifestation of this desire to achieve something great, to 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 make the vision come through. Now, this obviously scales a little bit. You start down at the bottom, and the most simple challenge of life is to just get into the next generation. So your most basic form of the will to create is to create a child. But then, as humans become more sophisticated, or even as animals become more sophisticated, you start thinking more about, right, how can I utterly dominate for a thousand years so like the lion will the the will the will to power as it manifests in the lion the lion will run around and kill all the other rival male lions and mate with all the female lions and then have many many children and that will guarantee his genetics for a long long time the same situation is and the dark side of that is that the 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 challenging lion will come in kill the dominant lion and then kill all the children lion and then re- repeat the process and whatnot so it's a it's a monstrous thing what happens in nature but it's always this competition for superpower you know super expansion big big and once you solve the simple stuff like all right just simply eat enough and get get into the next generation once you cope you start to aim at thriving and then when something like a human comes along they, of course, do all this. Like, as is well known, we evolve to be more polyamorous. We evolve to be more, you know, one man had many, many wives. There's some very bleak parts of Europe where uh, the the the, uh, the the man to woman ratio would be like one guy would have uh, would have 17 women or something like that. That's like the average how it works out. So each girl would have one child, whereas one guy would have like equivalently 17 children with 17 different women. And then obviously 16 dudes kind of got got shoved out with the gene pool in that sense. So you can see how the, these, these expansions things happen. But then as we expanded and became more sophisticated, perhaps we started to think more about, right, how do I establish like Rome for a thousand years? You often hear this off emperors. You know, you can imagine you, you conquer... You conquer reproduction, you conquer your job, and then you get gifted. You you achieve the status of Caesar. And you always hear this off the, the Saurons in the movies and all that. Watch Gladiator, for example, and uh, Commodus would say this. It's like, I wish to create a, a legacy for a thousand years, and it's the thousand-year kingdom. It's very interesting. They just set a sort of arbitrary super goal, like just this conception of time that's so large. And it's because once all this lower stuff has been has been dealt with, once you're Caesar, you don't really have to worry about needing a wife and all that stuff. Like, that's going to be provided. Money It's going to be provided. Power. Like you have all the power in the world. None of this stuff matters. You're you're literally at the top of the world. And so what happens is your your will to power now is, is, has nothing to do. So it's like, oh, what the fuck do I do now? Oh, well, I may as well make something that lasts, lasts for a thousand years. Maybe we'll achieve that one day and it'll be like the super Caesar. And he'll be like, what the fuck do I do now? <laughs> well, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll make a kingdom that will last forever. And or maybe I'll take over the universe. Like, who knows? But you can see the megalomania as as you conquer lower stuff, this megalomania grows in some sense. And Nietzsche was framing, suggesting that that's not necessarily a bad thing. Because what carried us from being little ants, you know, the, from carried us from being little, like, worms running around in, a, in the ocean and all this, you know, squiggling about there, being like, how do I... <laughs> How do I get my nut off? And then that's that's the height of their thoughts, if they have any. It's just instinct at that point. 
what carried us was the the worm that said i will i will i will i will worm out of this ocean and start going on land and conquer that territory and then you know you had your little shrew and your shrew says all right i'm gonna stand up on two legs and become a super shrew and then it turns into a human you know what i mean it's that type of desire that constant inbuilt desire to always expand and grow bigger is what makes us great and if we crush that we're in danger so to say all this about something like free will Nietzsche had a very interesting stance on this like he doesn't necessarily believe in free will he believes that we are carried by this desire now people like Freud and Jung they they, they frame it slightly differently they suggest that and they deal with this problem in a very interesting way they suggest that um, when it comes down to making a choice what happens is you are presented with you're presented with, you know, Christ or Satan, but you're not deciding which, you're deciding between. You're, you're not just like choosing anything. You're deciding between obeying your desires or obeying your, your, your higher morals. Freud would be the same. It's not like you sit there as this rational creature. This is, I guess, the delusion that they're trying to crush. You don't sit there as this like rational creature, say, since the enlightenment, I have completely solved the problem of my inbuilt nature and I am now a neutral neutral observer of the world and I will decide to do the right thing. Yes, that's what it is. I will free use my free will and completely conquer all that ugly, those ugly desires that I have and I will do the right thing. I will um, increase the well-being of the world. Yes, quite. No, they say that that's, that's utter bullshit and there's no experimental evidence there's no there's no like there's no phenomenological existential evidence that that's what happens it seems like you get presented with a desire to honor your lower instincts or your super ego on top of that and so all this stuff is derivative from this idea of Nietzsche and the will to power and this is really what I want to describe today because people as I say they, they hear about this and they're like oh my god let's let's do a video on Sauron and just put Nietzsche's face there instead of the eye or something like that they they reduce it in that sense and they show a lack of understanding of the nuance and what this man is trying to say. So as you can see, the, the phenomenological experience is that you don't rationally just make those choices. You, in some sense, choose between drives. Now, to turn it back to Nietzsche, what Nietzsche was suggesting, and this is the thing that sort of screwed with people like Freud's minds and whatnot, is that we don't really have this enlightenment free will to, you know figure out what we're going to do. What happens is we, 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 we get this impulse of instinct, of drive, of willst du max. We get this impulse to do something, an emotional charge. Go eat the sandwich. I'm hungry, you know. Um, I, want, uh, I would like a lover. I would like to, um, you know, have some romance. You get, you get these impulses and these kind of fight for you. Like sometimes when you're hungry, you're like, oh, God. Um, I, I need to go eat, I need to go eat, but maybe you're like in the middle of doing something and it, and it has meaning to you. So these, these impulses fight, or maybe, for example, you see a, a beautiful girl and you have this, shall we say, impulse to to um, perform some Romeo and Juliet with her, like, you know, engage in that, that type of romantic situation. You have the desire to have her. But then there's this other desire in you that's really afraid of... Of, of getting exposed to the tribe and so your primitive mind thinks oh my god if they see that um that i'm like you know if i lose my validation to the tribe if i get embarrassed in front of the tribe they might they might turn around they might murder me or something like that they might turn around and be like oh god look there's satan there's satan going trying to do a satanic thing so what i gotta do is i gotta we, we've gotta cut his head off or burn him alive or something like that so you have these competing drives like that's the great challenge when, when you're like being social is, is combating with this the fear of the the group versus the desire from beneath i guess it's similar to what freud was saying the fear of what the group will think versus desire coming in between um and so you see this there, there is a co competition going on fundamentally and the will to power to Nietzsche is actually manifest in all of these. This is a complicated idea, but it's it, the idea here is that sloppiness is part of life. And that is actually far more true to existence than philosophers who come at you and say, oh, no, no, everything is a rational explanation. Nietzsche was somewhat against that. It's like, oh, there's no systematic explanation for these things. We've got this blunt impulse that has just worked. It just drives us to always expanding and go better and all that. 
it manifests first as like just like nut into something that can procreate just get that done very coping very low you know low you can think of it like chakras very low vibrational energy it's quick scared some people call it the the or life history strategy the the short wave thinking like during a war your instinct says all right spread your seed don't, don't never don't invest in anything just get it out there and all that that's that's your low form of acting and that's your will to power that's your desire to to move on to create acting conservatively in some sense in, in, a, in an ironic sense just like get it done get it out there get it done and then as you move upper into that you start to move into this idea you could say the heart chakra where it's like all right right the things are things are settled now i can start thinking about all right monogamy invest in the child make the child strong and all that and that's like you know this this part of here and then it becomes interesting when you move into the the higher part where you're saying okay wait a second I've got my wife, I've got my, my lower drives and all this, but I'm my DNA is part of this larger larger group of DNA, you know, the tribe and all that. And if I can if I can save the tribe, if I can change the tribe's religion or something like that, if I can lead the tribe forward, if I can utilize these people and get them working as a team, we can guarantee stability for our ge- genetic imprints, our collective will to power for for, for a thousand years. And so you see how the, the will to power manifests in several several different ways. But of course, your your instincts don't really understand that. Like in some sense, your brain, this part of your brain that's figuring out that big vision is still competing with the other parts of your body because it's not like your your it's not like your your balls are gonna just vanish. It's not like your your heart is just gonna stop having emotions. It's gonna keep doing what it, it does because that has worked and it's not gonna turn off for any reason. You're still gonna be this like difficult competing crazy thing so you might meet an emperor who has this huge vision but he still has this vice of where he he loves to he, he sets up a brothel or something like that and then you'll hear there's a lot of very interesting stories where you'll have an emperor or something like that and his vices tend to be the thing that causes him to fall for example king solomon very famous king in the in the bible and if you don't know this you should read 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 these parts of your bible if you if you want to if you want to pretend to be a christian you should know this stuff king solomon um essentially was the richest man on earth at one point he he ruled ancient israel and he was i think the son of king david and he had like a thousand wives you know and the implication was that he was the peak of israel's power like he was like huge huge gold trade and all this and um he wrote a book he wrote, I think, in the Bible, the idea of of you'll never get any satisfaction unless from God. So it's almost that idea of the the broader supervision, whatever God represents. That's that's the thing that will bring you the most amount of peace. And of course, despite the fact that he had this this uh, the reproduction thing down, he had a thousand wives and whatnot. He um, fundamentally lost his power. He fundamentally failed. His vices were were brought out by him trying to always satisfy his wives, trying to always take care of them, you know, adapting to their cultures and all that. And he had so much going on that they, in some sense, tipped over his will to power. His will to power fell to these lower things and he lost out long term. And so we can see that these competitions continue to go and they happen in you as well. This is the point. You are not unified towards this vision, nor are you you unified towards like the lower impulses, although you can be. And it's it's an interesting question of how do we organize ourselves in this understanding? As like as a man, you will grow up and you will your instincts will take over, and you'll be like, ah, fuck all that bullshit, like achieving stuff, bullshit. I, I there's only one thing I want to achieve. And Nietzsche would say, all right, you're gonna have this chaos of desires and passions, all coming from the will to power, and what you need to do is you need to find within you the higher will, the the larger will, the, the highest will that most people never find, your ambition and whatnot. And you need to use that ambition to tame your other ones. And fundamentally, all attempts to defeat the will below only can be achieved by a higher will dominating it. You don't get to, you don't get to stop your will. You don't get to say, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to desire nothing. This is, this is his challenge towards people like Schopenhauer and um, ascetics. This is his challenge towards people who are like monks or like godlike and all that. He's almost suggesting that these people manage to, to, to beat all their lower 
drives by visualizing, as I was saying earlier, God or something like that, God's kingdom, this very, very abstract thing that may not be realistic, but it functions as this desire. I desire God. I desire this abstract idea. And they, they use this as this tool to beat these lower things and put them into order. And this is why you'll often see priests are very pro-chastity. They're very, very against things like indulgence, against instinctive vices and whatnot. It's a fascinating idea. It's a fascinating way of understanding human re um, reality. And Nietzsche uses this to call out people like priests and people like ascetics and people who, he, he, to call out the no-fap movement a little bit is that you're, you're, you're doing that uh, and, and as ascribing meaning to these lower things that are not there. God doesn't hate your instincts. Why would he make you that way if he hated your instincts? What type of riddle do you think you live in? So I want to describe how it feels and try to paint the categories onto those feelings. For example, inside your head, when you desire something, you it's almost like you've got an organ in your body that's making a demand on your nervous system. So... <laughs> Your 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 uh, your stomach shouts out, "I need food," and it sends that energy into your body mind, whatever. And so you get this feeling down in your belly, in the the belly chakra, if you will. At the same time, you get a dream that appears in your head of the perfect sandwich, which I shall I describe again with the with you know the lettuce, the ham. It's all like perfectly made and whatnot. You get that dream. And so your, your instinct says you are in hell, you are in hell. It reframes your reality and it says you are in hell, you are in hell, I am empty. And then it, this dream of heaven, this portal of transformation, this sandwich that will bring you to salvation. You can think of saliva or whatever. You can think of this, this place of peace, this place where the emotion is stopped, it is ended. And in some sense, this is the, uh, an interesting way to think about emotions is that emotions are largely... Dis, dis uncomfortable to to a large extent a lot of your emotions are uncomfortable because they're motivating tools they are trying to alert you to the fact that you're not fulfilling your drives properly your stomach saying you're not you're not honoring me properly and it so it puts you in a state of discomfort which motivates you to do a behavior the same with your your gonads down below it's the same thing it, it, they, the organ makes a demand on the nervous system and so you desire something you desire romance you desire whatever and then the dream comes and of course the dream will appear as a man or a woman in this situation and the, the portal is of course uh, the interaction or perhaps even a very specific form of interaction this is how this stuff works and you were uncomfortable you were like the, the the desire for someone is actually an incredibly uncomfortable emotion you're you're yearning you you need them and it's horrible you're like Oof. You know, you get the, you get hot and heavy and 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 and, uh, and nearly like you're spiked full of adrenaline. But people frame it as this sort of a uh, beautiful thing, which it is. I guess you could say it's beautiful, but they frame it as this sort of relaxing thing. No, that's definitely not what it's like. It, it kind of snaps you out of your peace. Like you're walking around your day. Think of how it works. You're walking around your day. You're chilled. Everything's calm and nice. And you're like, you know, full. You're just after eating. And then suddenly you see a beautiful girl, a beautiful guy. And then suddenly you're 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 jolted with a series of emotions that kind of put you and they take your mind over and you're thinking what do I do what do I do and what, what should I do should I go over and all this it it jolts at your head and suddenly your nervous system is shocked and you're like fuck what's going on here what's happening here what do I do and the desire is, is making demands on your peace your desire is pulling you away from your peace you know this is very, very interesting. So what, how do we deal with this? Because if we, and Nietzsche talks about this in Twilight of the Idols, um, and this is, this is just a brilliant thought, that people who get into this stuff are so incompetent at. And this is a really good testament towards why you got to be very careful who you listen, listen to, because there's a vast amount of incompetence with this stuff, a, a, a vast amount of bad thinking. People are very black and white with this. They will say... Like, for example, the, the traditional um, criticism of the Christian frame is that they come in and they tell you all desires are Satan, you must kill them all off. And then you will get people like Buddhists and Schopenhauer and Nietzsche would cr criticize these people. They, they, they place morality on these desires. They say moral actions are dependent on these desires in a sense that the desires are bad. So all of these emotions, desire for love, lust, um, hunger, gluttony, all these things are all negative and you must crush them out of you altogether. 
And so that's it. It's black or white. It's like gone, all gone. And then Nietzsche comes along and, and says his stuff and people read like a couple of pages and a couple of nice quotes. And then they say, ha, Christianity was wrong. Christianity is full of shit. It was delusional. Richard Dawkins is the fucking Messiah, man. And then they'll come in and they'll say, okay, sweet. So they were completely wrong about desires being bad. So we must oscillate to the other side. They become hedonists. So you have a negative hedonist. You have a positive hedonist. These hedonists will say, your emotions are, are glorious. You must absolutely follow them completely allow them act, let your impulses take over and so they drag you around and like you wake up in the morning and you're like yeah start the day with some porn and some ice cream and then you do this for 10 years and you're just an absolute disaster at that point you've, you've just riddled with like i don't know you're just destroyed because it's 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 indolence you know it's um debauchery it pulls you apart and so that hedonism that 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 nihilistic hedonism is completely useless as well it's wrong because it's framing in a black and white sense and so what we have is we have a false dichotomy which we must dissolve and look at the first principle what is the first principle these people are looking at instincts and they're premising morality on suffering feelings instincts they're premising what's right and wrong based on this it's delusional it's incorrect completely incorrect and Nietzsche points this out like, it's, it's not about crushing your instincts. It's not about giving in to them. If you give in to your desires, you will get pulled apart because they're chaotic, they're sloppy. Nature did her best to get us to where we are, but we're not perfect. We're not or ordered properly. We have this, um, this, this split in our desires, hunger, desire for bonding, desire for uh, a large amount of procreation. And then sometimes, if we're lucky, desire for ambition, desire for status, desire to have un an understanding of the world. All these things compete, you know? And so Nietzsche would suggest that we must take an attitude of spiritualization of our desires, which is fascinating. The Christians sort of do this, but they do it wrong, he believes. They, they suggest it's all negative. He says the idea is that we see them sort of as these little sloppy gods, if you will, these little powers, because that's what they are. Like there's no way around that. And they're, they're like uh, the, the, the palette of colors. And your job is to take them and order them towards something more noble. Your job is to take these different desires and whip them into shape so that they work together. So you are original sin. You are an unfinished product. You were born not perfect and it's your job to work on yourself to whip yourself into shape and this is what he would describe as the will to power coming in the will, this you've got all these lower wills that are competing I've, I've talked about this before you go into the courtroom of jupiter or zeus and you have all like mars you have aphrodite and they're all smoking and drinking and acting like idiots and fighting with each other and then zeus or jupiter walks in it says, listen, you shut the fuck up. You're all going to listen to me and I'll beat the crap out of you if you don't. And so he establishes order. He doesn't, he doesn't go in and shoot Mars. He doesn't go in and, you know, stab Aphrodite. He doesn't say, you never get to speak. He says, you must listen to our rules and we will teach you how to speak appropriately so we work together as a team properly. It's about ordering the chaos. It's about taking the, or, uh, the Eros and adding a Logos to it. And that would be the higher will to power dominating the lower will to powers. And when you are making a choice, you are always sacrificing one of these to the other. There's no such thing as this, you know, um, Zeus doesn't come in and float abstractly and say, I will make decisions now. I don't need you anymore. They, they will still keep bubbling underneath him. Mars and, 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 and uh, Aphrodite will still keep pulling them apart. And this is Nietzsche's call out is that, yes, you get these priests and all this who, who, who tell you that they don't need these emotions. These emotions are evil. But what happens is these emotions get shoved unconscious and drive these people anyway. These people, these priests have a will to power just the same as anyone else. And history has evidently proved that, that like you'll get popes who get into politics. That's very, very common. And that's because these people are simply in denial. But nature doesn't care what you think. You're prone to self-delusion. Nature doesn't care how you're modeling your world or how much what you're saying you believe. She will just use you for her ends. And so if you're walking around being like, I'm doing this for God, like think of what think of how these think of how these 
these these great wars would happen, the Crusades and all that stuff. They would say it's Deus Vult, it's the will of God. I think it sounds a little bit more like your will. Do you know what I mean? And you're just uh, coming up with a good story to describe that. And so this is this is how Nietzsche would start framing things, and it's a very accurate description of what goes on and it's a very useful description to understand your own self deception and whatnot you take all these desires you order them and push them in the right direction and so this becomes an issue like where how did we how do we make choices what do we do and it seems that the most useful thing is vision the most useful thing is the big goal because that's the thing a lot of these things lack. As we said, hunger, sexual desire makes you feel like you're in hell. You're lonely. But this, this heaven that it offers, this portal is the person or the thing. This heaven that it offers is what appears in your head. Oh, imagine, like, you, you, it's, it's interesting when you think about with, with lovers, you imagine yourself during the act or just afterwards we are like relaxed together hugging or or these type of things or same with the food you 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 can almost taste it in your mouth you know you're you're dreaming of the heaven you're not dreaming of the specifics about how to do it you're dreaming of this and this motivates you to figure out how to do it this motivates you to go act and whatnot and so if we want to order if we if we if it's possible for us to have the choice, but I'm going to dodge that whole argument and suggest that it is, and this is simply the pragmatic tool for you to do that. If we are to put all this stuff into order, we must look at our higher vision. What is our Zeus? What is our Jupiter? What is our Yahweh? Whatever. Like, what is this higher God? What is this higher vision? This vision for God? Whatever you want to call it. What is this thing that is leading us to reach beyond the demands of our lower emotions? And this is the probably the greatest this is probably the greatest argument for religion from Nietzsche. That stuff like this offers people these type of visions. And then if you got modern nihilists and all that, he'd be like, You're you're ridiculous. Nihilism means I have no vision. That's it. Perhaps the world is empty and meaningless. But you can give it a meaning with your vision. And for you to say, it's empty and meaningless, I will just fall into my hedonism, that's a confession of weakness, a failure. That's fundamentally what it is. And people say Nietzsche's a nihilist. It's like you don't understand what Nietzsche was saying he was. You would look at all great people and see the vision is there. They face the chaos of the world and they somehow pull out a vision. Now, this vision is actually connected to a desire within us we do desire these big things these things fall to the wayside when we have lower problems when we're out of cash when we're out of when we're out of uh yeah when, like all, all these things like uh, loneliness and all that uh, hunger uh, safety these things will come in and they will start gnawing away at us and then our vision our desire for this big thousand year conquest that we that we want you know our, our big ambition for our life to become the great artist to become the great athlete to become the great speaker to become the great whatever these things fall to these lower things were a significant problem but if you can allow that voice to become resonant enough despite the fact that you're in poverty or privation, as he says, that can lead you to become an incredibly powerful person because you can impose order and adjust order on your desires. You might say something, for example, your your lowest desire, your desire for sex demands that you have as many partners as possible, for example. And people will say, well, that's what our instinct's about, so therefore it's correct. It's like, okay, f fair enough. But say if you were, your your thought was... Okay, I have that desire, but I also want to create a thousand-year kingdom. So does this thousand-year kingdom then turn its judgmental, godlike eye and that lower desire, the lower chakra, and say, what value does it if I waste all my time pursuing that nonsense? If I run around trying to waste all that time, trying to get girls, trying to, you know, being on Tinder and all that, this judgmental eye falls upon it and suddenly the desire gets exposed in the face of the higher vision. Same with your hunger and all that. All these, these get exposed to the judgment of the higher ideal. And so you say to yourself, maybe it'd be better for the long game for me to look into something like monogamy. 
despite the fact that there might be no God-based justice for something like that, since we are modern nihilists, despite the fact that it might not be the key to heaven, still with a strong vision, this falls by the wayside quite a lot. That's an interesting thought. You will see people who are possessed by their lower desires that they tend to be possessed by them. They will rationalize it has no meaning, but it takes up their entire mind. And then you ask them about stuff like ambition, and it seems absent. Something very much to think about. And so if you can gift yourself such an ambition, how much will it help you begin to order your life? Nietzsche believed that this is a key towards putting yourself in order. And by that, he means taking this chaos in, within you and channeling towards one thing. And then that's your challenge. How do I figure out the channel on my desires towards this one thing? Like what a Caesar would say, all right, well, se sex is real and it's important and it can't be, it can't, I can't dishonor it. So what must I do? Must I think, well, a part of my thousand year reign must be having a, a child. So maybe that's the way I direct it of some sort. It becomes fascinating. It's about thinking long term, about thinking big. And people will do anything to avoid thinking big because what happens, interestingly, is that when you put a vision, when you assert a goal, as Jordan Peterson says, it becomes a judge. When you assert a vision, I want to achieve this, I want to achieve this, suddenly all of your actions have consequences in the long term. All of your impulse actions are sacrifices towards that goal. And suddenly you start to have to ask those really difficult questions. What am I sacrificing personally for this bigger vision? What am I, like that, that ice cream, what value is it bringing to the bigger vision? It tastes good now, but that's gonna just drift into the ocean of time. What's gonna happen then after that, I'll feel sad. You will judge yourself. You will feel shame. You'll feel failure. You'll feel like you're drifting away. But then every little win, every patient little win, you will start to get more motivated because you'll understand the context of how it fits towards the bigger goal and whatnot. Fascinating stuff because it seems to be psychologically relevant. And to bounce back to Freud, and Jung, then of course Freud would position the superego as that t somewhat that tool, that that part of your mind that stores these bigger long-term visions. And this is where things like morality come from and law, because these bigger long-term visions impose this shame upon you, and then your desires impose these demands upon you, and the ego wars between them. Who knows how much that is free will. Nonetheless, this is what it phenomenologically feels like. And so your question is, and this, this is a dangerous question. And this is, I'm going to start talking about Christianity here for a second. But your question is, how much of that superego has been socially conditioned in me? How much of that vision is mine? Terence McKenna, might have been Terence McKenna, said something along the lines of, if you don't have a plan, you will become part of someone else's plan. What does that mean? That if you are there walking around your life and you haven't put yourself in order and you've, you haven't thought about what you're doing, you are very likely obeying someone else. And that's something to think about the nihilists. Like you study someone like Edward Bernays and what he describes is the, 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 his ability to manipulate. Well, he doesn't describe. You, you look at the way he behaved and you notice that his ability to manipulate people's desires was what he used to get power. He would offer people visions. He would offer people products, all these type of things. He figured out the psychology. He was Freud's nephew of uh, marketing. He was a mass marketer, one of the first great ones. And so you think that, you know, you just operating on your nihilistic desires is you being free. But of course, Bernays, a man you've never even heard of, is getting rich off that because he's selling you junk. He's putting fluoride in your water. He's uh, teaching you. He's getting you to eat breakfast. He's getting women to smoke. There's the best one. He paid a load of actresses to walk down New York Street, smoke cigarettes, so he could get half of the market that was not smoking to start smoking. And they were walking down because it was to do with um, women's liberation. He weaponized their liberation, their desire to be free, because it, 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 they couldn't conceptualize how it could be used against them. He floated in and he used it to his advantage. He 
took your desire and steered it that way. Astounding. Whose plan are you serving? That's something to think about. And so if you don't have that desire, you're not stable because you can get taken over by the puppet master and whatnot. And most people, this is the very, very difficult struggle. This is a very, very difficult question to ask. Most people can't think what their goal is. Most people don't want to think what their goal is. This would be Nietzsche's conception of, like, why why do we assume that everybody's going to achieve individuation? I don't think they can. And that's a very, very difficult issue. Most people won't be able to do this because this requires you to be incredibly ruthless with yourself. This requires you to turn inwards and call yourself out in your bullshit and requires an incredible amount of self-discipline. Can people do that? Most people need to fall into institutions that do this for them because that super ego gives them their vision. Some great people will be able to break it apart and insert their own vision. But most won't. Most need to obey something. And so the idea behind religion is that it gives people a vision that is noble. It gives them a vision that is good. Because if you take away religion, you fall prey to people like Edward Bernays. You are very vulnerable. Because you're not smart enough to... Edward Bernays is smarter than you. And you might like, he's evil. He's not evil. He's, he's as evil as a lion is evil. He's taking advantage of your gazelle-like nature, your your inability to compete with him. That's all he's doing. And so we must ask questions then about something like religion. These people are coming in once religion is gone, taking advantage of that. So what value did religion have? You know, maybe it was maybe it was oppressive, tyrannical. You can definitely make arguments about this because things are not black and white. Things are sloppy. It can be both serving people and also oppressive. The free thinkers might struggle against religion, but it might also still serve people. It might also still be a great force for social stability. It's very possible these things could be this way. And it's a question of, well, how do we manage the free thinkers? We need those innovators to have liberation. Look what happened when we had the Enlightenment and essentially got rid of religion. We exploded into a superpower of industry. It's changed the world in like, like that. But at the same time, we've become very vulnerable for the same thing. How do we strike this balance correctly? And this is the question. This is these questions that are very advanced and very difficult. And what do we do about them? So the argument for something like Christianity that I see that is the most convincing one and also the most reductionist one. So this this one is not necessarily appealing to belief in God and all this stuff. Is that, as we said, Jung said, framed the idea that your super ego is sort of represented as Jesus. Jesus represented as the most ideal man to act, the hero. And you have Satan down below. And he's your desires, as we just described, your lower wills to power. And uh, Christ is up here and he's offering you a way of behaving that will be virtuous, be good, be very adaptable towards a functioning society. And so if you personally participate in that religion, if the the vast amount of people participate in that religion and act Christ-like, they will create within them a community which will produce the situation where people don't descend into hedonism or descend into violence or whatnot. It creates a very stable environment. It creates a heaven with which to live in. And most people want to say, okay, cool, that's good. Everybody can be Christian and I'll be the exceptional individual. I'll be the one that's beyond Christianity. And bit of a challenge, you know? Are, are you sure you're that person? Are you sure you're allowed to be that person? Who knows? But you can see the argument for that. You can see the argument of performing. What would Jesus do? Creates the situation for king. It creates the correct energy for the kingdom of God to descend on earth. So the promise may be true in a sense. Very interesting thought. It makes them resistant to a lot of the bullshit as well. But then we have the more difficult question of what do we do with the free thinkers or the leaders of these religions and whatnot. And that's where that will to power thing comes in. That's where you have to start asking yourself, what is our vision for our kingdom? What is our goal? What are we doing here? Well, how do we how do we present the world to these people? The Catholic Church was this giant, you know, giant tool for 
creating a dream. Now the media is another giant tool. Hollywood and the media is another giant tool for creating another dream. The Catholic Church was an earlier one and it took all these people and offered them the vision of what their life should be. And it had its way of working and it had its downsides. The same with the modern media. Everyone is free now, but obviously people don't understand a lot of this stuff, so they, they don't make good choices. So what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to go in and say to these institutions, right, this is the dream we need to start presenting. We need to start giving, we need to start renovating this vision. Do we go back to Christianity? What do we do? That's a confusing and difficult question. And I guess if you think you're up to it, this is in somewhat why you're here. But I have no answers for you. Merely painting the picture. But this is how I would frame all of this I, this idea of will to power. This is what Nietzsche, I think, saw as one of his most fundamental ideals. I think it's vastly misunderstood and it, it's vastly misrepresented as well as Sauron or as you can be an absolute free nihilist and nothing matters or might makes right. Just because perhaps might does make right, it doesn't mean you you have to like look at it as this like blunt force of violence there are other ways that power works and there's perhaps more sophisticated ways it could work as we we're saying these these religious structures are extremely valuable in some sense and so as you can see from what i'm describing this religion stuff it's quite complicated and people don't want it to be relevant they want to be able to conveniently brush it all aside and tell it to go go off go off have a go off moment with it and tell her to go away and leave it alone leave leave me alone but these these things are have an incomprehensibly large impact on our life and you might wonder why you know this is the modern pathology that i'm trying to describe here we have this idea that i can just figure it all out by myself because i am an individual and i am free individualism uber alles i what i will do is i will individuate like what young said and that will just I'll make it all happen i'll get it all right and as i'm trying to frame here well if you're gonna do that if you want to get better you need a vision and look you probably already know that but you don't do it you don't sit down and do the actual work that involves doing you most certainly don't discipline yourself to put that stuff in order but if you do you will start moving towards it but then becomes the question is like what it is what is a vision how do i visualize something and you'll then come across the astounding realization that you are a social animal that sits within the context of a collective and so your vision almost always must align with the vision of everyone else and the a large amount of your goals depend entirely on people you want relationships you want lover and you want income now income is an interesting one because people think it's it's sort of separate from all that but no money revolves around social use it revolves around people as well your network of of cash is a people thing businesses are about getting people into a space where they'll do a specific behavior largely buying and all that it's all people orientated you know all people orientated the collective is the thing that function that that fits in most perfectly to your conception of your vision your dream the roman empire thinks of the roman emperor the caesar thinks of the thousand year collective the thousand year kingdom you know you think of your family your network of friends around that and the peace that that creates your community and then obviously the community fits within the larger collective as well that's your kingdom that's your vision in some sense so if your vision is as simple as i just want the white picket fence and hey there's ain't nothing wrong with that they say it in the, the book of proverbs a man who does a good job is more valuable than a king the humble guy who just gets his house in order has his family and does you know the jordan peterson attitude to things and just gets all that stuff working look it's noble useful and difficult so it's worth doing but it fits within the context of something bigger and so the conception of that bigger thing must always be present but but you have an issue in order to get your house in order that takes an immense amount of work so you can't you can't sit there like a philosopher like some fucking idiot and think how do i how do i how do i fix the collective you know 
how do I make the collective work so that my vision can come true? What? You're going to do that as well? You're going to do it all? Are you insane? It, it's First of all, it's arrogant. It's kind of unfair in yourself. You need, you need, you definitely need to start thinking about compromise. Yes, okay, we'd all love to be a Roman Caesar where we can command everything, but sadly, most people will never achieve that level of power. They will have to contextualize themselves. And to give you an example, like perhaps I could keep digging into this stuff and be like, hmm, how to destroy all religions and start a new religion. That's perfect. That solves all these problems. But then if I think about my vision, my goal, like I'd, I'd like much more to go down to the artistic direction. And that's an interesting one because does the artist necessarily need the true religion? Does the artist necessarily need the truth? Perhaps I should compromise on that vision where I'll, I'll like you know I'll be the Caesar who creates the perfect true society and maybe I could think more about the Renaissance artist this is the artist who has come across Greco-Roman polytheism for the first time in a thousand years in a Christian society and you know what they did instead of saying out with this Christianity out with this Catholicism what they did is they adapted to Catholicism and they sort of Hellenized they Romanized Christianity, the Catholicism that they live in, they created the Renaissance, they, they, they took David and they created this tall Michelangelo statue of David, a very Greco attitude towards art, making an aesthetic handsome David, they painted beautiful pictures of the Last Supper, you know, they took what was there in order to reach their vision, which was high-minded aesthetics, the Sistine Chapel is another example, they weren't obsessing over something like the truth there was actually higher order goals here they weren't being like autistic being like all right we have to destroy catholicism now because this the hellenistic religion it conflicts all that stuff we have to destroy it now they're like oh, i don't i don't give a crap i'm gonna use what's here i'm gonna make use of what's here even if it ain't perfect it's like what I'm saying about this Christian thing, this Catholicism thing. Maybe those churches weren't perfect. There's plenty of evidence to suggest that. But they worked. That does, so it, there is value. None of this stuff is black and white. And if you want to do this advanced stuff and you want to think black and white, please walk out the door. You're, this is not for you at all. And you'll make mistakes and you'll cause problems. Listen. Listen to the complex stuff. Like... This, this is the issue with people like Nietzsche is that people are, are incapable of thinking with nuance. So they read Nietzsche and they actually can't see it. They can only see black and white. And then they, they come on and they say, this is what Nietzsche said. You're like, Re what? <laughs> I'm going to give it like shadow work or something like that. So yeah, like the, the, the instinct of the artist, the, the goal, the will to power of the artist, this doesn't, isn't necessarily some abstract conquest of all religion and truth it might be something more along the lines of what works to get that aesthetic and all that and aren't you the same your the thing you want to create your art might be a family like jordan peterson promotes just get your house in order get a house that's that's maybe all it is and so maybe you need to start asking yourself well what visions are already here that I can graph onto. How do these visions align? This is where you start deciding about stuff like community. You say, well, there's, like, this is why people might turn to religion. Oh, well, there's a community that offers me a vision. You know? This is why people might turn away from that. Maybe you grow up, you grow up in a strict Christian community and it, it, you're getting all the bad sides of Christianity or the, the, the natural religion or the, 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 the modern religion and you say, fuck this, I'm going to go and and live free. And so you'll graft yourself onto the, 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 the kind of city folk religion that's going on right now, you know? And you'll go there and you'll accept, accept all those dogmas because they allow you to become an artist or express yourself in a certain way. And it allows you to get your will to power and whatnot. And so there's a stark devaluation of individualism here that's profound and difficult to conceptualize properly. And if you were to make intelligent choices... Well, we have to ask difficult questions. What do we do about all this stuff? And it fundamentally comes down to 
No answers, only questions. Because that is what life is like. It is sloppy. I can paint that picture for you and say, this is sort of how your desires war against each other. What it means, I do not know. But practically, this is how it works. So make the most of that. And then understand how much your ideals might get in the way. Understand how much you may not be thinking correctly. Just like when God fell, people struggle to understand why would this matter? Why would it matter if God fell? Why would it matter if Christianity died and all this? When God fell, it was like the will to power Jupiter fell. It's the same thing, you know? And so what happens is the lower desires were liberated to do whatever they want and fight among each other. And if you look around right now, you actually see society sort of pulling itself apart as if it's someone who is eating ice cream in the morning and, you know, watching a lot of porn in the afternoon. Someone who's getting pulled around and has no higher vision. And the argument against Christianity from this perspective is that question of how are we going to get a new vision? Is, is our problem that we need a new vision? And is Christianity an obstacle to that? Who knows? Again, a nuanced, difficult problem. But nonetheless, you see, this is all this stuff that's going on and you fit within this story and this is your story and this will be your, this, will, this is what your life will be about. Assuming I am correct, I'm assuming I'm not reading Nietzsche with some bias, assuming this isn't my will to power to brainwash you so I can become Sauron or something like that. Assuming all of that stuff is in order, your drama will be understanding that you live in a in a place that is pulling itself apart, that has no vision. And we're starting to ask ourselves, how do we put that back? I see a lot of people reverting back to Christianity. I see a lot of people suggesting we should push forward. And I see a lot of people who are already pushing forward in very successful ways. The socialist movement, with its very clear vision of the utopia, is doing a great job. Now, you might not agree with it. It might not be correct. It might not be smart. It might lead us into Bolshevik Russia all over again. But that doesn't matter. Just like Bernays is not evil. It's not. It's just it's they're solving the problem. They're offering a vision. And you can sit there and whine and complain and tell everybody, let's go back to Christianity. But if it doesn't work, you're going to fail. So you have to think about that stuff. If you want to do this, maybe it'd be smarter for you not to think about this stuff. There's another thought. Maybe it'd be smarter for you to, and I literally mean smarter, maybe it'd be a, an executive decision for you to turn around and say, I don't give a crap about this. I'm, I've, I've got my standards that I need. I'm going to find a community of people. I don't give a crap if, they, if they're Buddhist like or Hindu or something like that. I'm going, to, I'm going to join that as long as it gives me my stable situation, my stable community so I can build a family and whatnot. All of this stuff comes into play. Difficult, crazy, complex stuff. And you're right at the center. So I hope I have painted that picture for you successfully. And I hope it helps you make decisions so that you do not end up hugging a horse and going insane. Now, all of this is all well and good in theory, in the abstract. These eternal principles, discipline, patience, the ability to master, the Wils du Max, the Ubermensch and all that, these are all cool. And knowing about them and being able to present them, you know, in, in the corner among all those people, those significant people that matter to you, that's, yeah, that's all well and good, but... The real step, the step that I always try to hold myself to as a standard is embodying this stuff. The idea, I guess, is that all the great men throughout history, all the great people throughout history, they have embodied these virtues and lived lives and then become renowned for the virtuous lives they live, for their achievements, for their accomplishments, for what they've done. And then people study them and find the virtues in them. That's why we revere them. It's like, oh, this is what made him great. And then they'll pull out this concept. Oh, it made him great because he was stoic. It made him great because he told the truth. It made him great because he had relentless imagination and all that. And then you have the principle. But just because you know it doesn't mean that you are it. You must train it into you. And that is a much different form of knowledge. People often get caught up in this idea that information is skill. It is not and skill is true learning. 
So what I'm doing with the consultations is I'm taking a very specific set of principles that I am very good at, get, at translating to people. And that is emotional intelligence and storytelling, the, the principles that revolve around that. And just like uh, the gym involves certain principles, progressive overload, the right techniques, the right patterns, the right movements and all that. And it's better to get a mentor or a coach or a, someone to come in there with you, a personal trainer, and show you what to do and keep you accountable and keep you on track for like a an extended set of time so that you can make the gains. That's exactly the attitude I'm taking in these consultations. And the people who I see it working with are those who are invested for a long period of time, who are taking it serious like it was the gym. They, they're not looking at it like, all right, I'll just watch a few more YouTube videos and then, and then what? The muscle will grow. The principles are very, very simple and usually you just need someone to, to, to work with you. Like if you're to learn boxing, you need, you need to go in there and spar, and then you need to go back to your coach in the corner and be like, uh, so what happened there? How should I interpret that experience? And so when it comes to the interaction within or the interaction without, what you are doing is you're gathering experiences. And when you're getting someone like a coach, all they're going to do is sit with you and help you interpret that stuff so that you can embody the principles, so that you can make sense of the chaos and increase your gains, and gain a power, and gain a power that is probably one of the keys towards opening up vistas of opportunity in your life. Like, look at what I have achieved with simply my speaking on YouTube so far, and, and I've only just begun. Imagine how far stuff like this could go. And it's a permanent skill. It's so based in your understanding of your mind. It's so core towards representing who you are, that if you can gain emotional intelligence and storytelling and mentality, this thing gives you an immense amount of power. Think of fighting, for example. I'm sure there's many, there's better fighters than Conor McGregor, but few are as known or as renowned as him. And that was on account of how he presented himself on top of how he fought. And so if you're interested in making that investment with me, committing the time. And that's really what it's all about. Look, I know some people can't commit the time or they can't commit the resources. That's fine. I put out lots of stuff for free. I put out as much value as I can for free. I, I believe in that stuff. Free stuff ha has helped me before. And so I, I, I adhore you to use that free stuff and put that stuff into action. But if you're looking, if you're that small group of people who are looking to take it to the next level, to really push then email me, get in contact, and we'll start doing something. We'll set it up and we'll get serious about this because I love seeing people improve. I, I, it's, it's, it's a buzz. I love that stuff and I love passing it on and I have a passion for this. So pop down there, give me a shout. We'll have a chat. We'll get you up and running and we will set up a plan and get this skill and get these principles embodied within you. Talk to you later, people. <laughs>